everyone. I am City Councilor Ricardo Arroyo. I'm the chair of the Committee on Government Operations. It is Thursday, March 30th, 2023. And we are here today for a virtual hearing on docket 0452, an ordinance providing remote access to meetings of municipal public bodies referred to the committee on March 1st, 2023. The docket was sponsored by Councilors Liz Braden and Rosie louis -Gen. In accordance with chapter two of the acts of 2023, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law and relieving public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement that public bodies conduct their meetings in a public place that is open and is physically accessible to the public the City Council will be conducting this hearing remotely and it is being recorded. This enables the City Council to carry out its responsibilities while ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate alternative means. The public may watch this hearing via live stream at www.boston.gov slash City Council TV or on Xfinity 8 RCN 82 Fios 964. With written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.go at boston.gov and will be made a part of the record and available to all counselors. If you wish to provide public testimony and have not signed up to do so, please email Christine O'Donnell at christine.odonnell at boston.gov. For those giving public testimony, please make sure that your name is visible so that I may call on you. Members of the public will be promoted to panelists when your name is called. Please make sure that you click yes when you are prompted to join as a panelist. This afternoon, I'm joined by my council colleagues, Council President Flynn, Councilor Lucy Louis-Jen, and Councilor Liz Braden. This ordinance seeks to amend the City of Boston Code Ordinances Chapter 1 to add Section 1.8, Remote Access to Meetings of Municipal Public Bodies. This would codify policies ensuring permanent remote access for members of the public to attend and testify at meetings of the city's several boards and commissions, including the Boston City Council. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, former Governor Baker issued an executive order suspending certain provisions of the state's open meeting law, which was set to expire on March 31st, 2023. Yesterday, on March 29th, Governor Moore Healy signed the supplemental budget, which included extending remote access through March of 2025. This hearing is an opportunity for counselors to hear from the administration, advocates, as well as public testimony, as, get, as well as public testimony and can give public testimony on the matter in front of us. As chair, I will allow my council colleagues to make opening remarks, beginning with the lead sponsors, Councillor Braden and Councillor Louis Jenner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um... And thank you to my co-sponsor, Councillor Louis Jean. Um, you know, being able to have our uh, residents participate remotely in uh, in our business throughout COVID has been an incredible um, opportunity. Uh, but and, and apart from just the necessity, so that our folks who are um, we're all we're all working remote, but we were able to continue the business of this of the city. Uh, through using technology. Uh, it also became very apparent in that process that we had in, saw increased participation in, in public meetings. Uh, we had folks who uh, were home-based uh, and had responsibilities for childcare or care of an elder, uh, were working different shifts, had a disability. Uh, so we saw an increase in the number of, of our residents who were actually able to participate and deliberate uh, in, in public meetings during that time. And I'm very relieved to see that uh, the governor has extended the, the length of time that we can continue to uh, use remote uh, access uh, through March 31st, 2025. But and I also feel that this is an opportune moment for us to make this a permanent um, uh, accommodation for our residents who are not easily able to get to City Hall or to other government buildings to be able to participate in our democracy. And I'm hopeful that with our conversation today that we will actually find a, a way to codify this and make this a permanent accommodation so that our residents uh, all across the city are continued, increase their ability to participate in um, in our boards and, and comment at meetings and our boards and commissions across the city. So thank you uh, for all of the panelists this afternoon and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Braden, Councillor Louis Jen. Sorry, Ricky. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Braden, for your leadership on this issue. Um, it is incredibly important that we need to grow democracy, especially in an era where so much is being done to really stop 
the growth of our democracy and really uh, prevent active participation. Uh, so ensuring remote access, like uh, Councillor Braden said, um, is integral to, to a robust city where we're able to really build policy based on really having public input. I mean, we know for our families that work late, that have uh, that are juggling a lot, that remote participation in Zoom has has really increased um, uh, the availability, the, the ability of us to hear from our residents. And so, I'm encouraged by the governor expen uh, extending remote participation until 2025. Like Councilor Braden said, there's an opportunity here for us to make it permanent and for also to think about. What are the ways um, that we need to increase the community building that often happens via public participation that sometimes happens in person, but you don't necessarily always get via remote access. Um, I think about how sometimes at public meetings, um, the comment sections are turned off or you're not able to see who else is in the room or in the Zoom. And I think that's an incredibly important part to do sort of democracy building. So I think there's room for us to do more work here um, but we all know for us, and even as counselors, virtual or hybrid hearings can simply um, really be, you know, transformative for how folks are able to participate and access um, their government. So thank you uh, to everyone for being here, and I look forward to hearing uh, from the advocates, and thank you to everyone for the comments on how we can, um, uh, how, uh, about supporting this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Louis Dan. I would like to give uh, Council President Flynn a moment to speak if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and something I've dedicated my career is supporting rights of especially persons with disabilities. It's critical we provide them with respect and dignity. I was just down, just digressing a bit, I was just down Bowdoin Street meeting with some residents. The Bowdoin Street MBTA stop, which is on the blue line, the escalator, we talk about disability rights, uh, the escalator has been down now for a year, as as has other um, MBTA stops. I say that because we need to make sure we treat our persons with disabilities and seniors with respect and dignity. Um, having said that, I support I support remote access for for residents that want to engage city councilors. I think it's important. I think it's an important part of democracy. But let me let me also say that I think it's important for city councilors to to be in the building in this in city hall. So when residents do come to these meetings that they can engage city councilors before the meeting, after the meeting, during the meeting. Um, I don't think it's necessary for city councilors to to do their remote uh, meetings from home or from from a, a, another location. So I think it's important that we, we we provide access to persons with disabilities, but also but also hold us accountable, hold city councilors accountable for showing up, for doing the work, for being here, um, and not missing meetings, being here on time, staying late, and talking to residents. That's also part of city government. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. I see Councilor Mejia has joined us. Councilor Mejia, if you'd like to give an opening statement. If you'd like to give uh, an opening. Good afternoon. My internet is unstable. Okay, so we'll just go straight to... Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Councilor Arroyo, um, my internet is unstable. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Now you're muted, but we can hear you. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. All right. Okay, thank you, Councilor Arroyo. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, ask for the record um, if Councilor Breeden or Councilor Louis Jen can confirm. I believe I was signed on as a third sponsor in this virtual um, hearing. Uh, I remember in 2020, we worked alongside Councilor uh, Edwards and Councilor Louis, uh, Councilor Councillor um, Councillor uh, Breeden uh, to ensure that we continue to offer people remote access uh, during the pandemic, and I just wanted to make sure that I'm also part of uh, of this conversation, and I just need some clarity around that, and then I have some opening remarks. So if you can confirm for me, that would be great.
I'm not sure if this happened at the meeting, uh, Councilor Mejia, it might have been the meeting that you were uh, unable to attend, which would have meant they wouldn't have been able to add you on the floor. Okay. Well, so then for the record, y'all, those who are paying attention, um, if you already know, you know that I, I campaigned on the fact that we needed to have um, hearings and people being able to access city government and hearings, uh, public hearings and meetings, even before we had a pandemic. So I had already been talking about that because one of the rules of engagement is uh, breaking down the barriers and allowing people to be able to be heard. And so when people were asking me what was going to be my first hearing, I said I was going to do a hearing on public hearings because we were not being heard. So I just wanted to uh, underscore how excited I am for us to have this conversation and to support this initiative that my colleagues are, are, are taking the charge with. Um, and I also wanted to just make note that, you know, as a citywide counselor, I'm in these streets all day, every day, because also in the streets is when you hear what people need and the type of services that they're seeking. So I think to Councillor Flynn's point, we need to both be accessible um, in City Hall, but we also need to be accessible out in these streets because most of my constituent services are done in, in areas um, and in locations where people don't even know what City Council is, let alone what it is that we're supposed to do. So I think that accessibility is really key and we have an opportunity to really seize this moment to educate our, our, our constituents about the importance and the power of their voice. Um, and I look forward to uh, listening and, and continuing to be a loud voice on all things that deal with creating space for people to be fully expressed and heard. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Uh, I'm now going to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have two panels going. Uh, we'll have the administration go first, but we are joined by Brianna Melor, the Chief of Community Engagement for the City of Boston, Andrea Patton, Chief of Staff for the Commission for Persons with Disabilities. I believe Kristen McCosh is also here, the Commissioner for the Mayor's Commission for Persons with Disabilities, uh, though I'm not sure she's going to be speaking unless there's some very specific. Uh, for advocates, we have Cade Crawford, the Director for the Technology uh, for Liberty Programs for ACLU of Massachusetts, Rick Glassman, Director of Advocacy for the Disability Law Center, uh, Jeff Foster, Executive Director for Common Cause Massachusetts, and Daniela DePina, the peer advocate for Boston Center for Independent Living. I'm going to go to the administration first, which is Brianna Malore and Andrea Patton, uh, or Andrea Patton. Make sure I'm pronouncing that. There's two different versions of, of Andrea. Andrea, so whichever one it is, please do correct me. Uh, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to say thank you to the chair, Chair Royo, um, Council President Flynn, and um, the sponsors, both Councillor um, Braden and Louisiane, and also thank you, Councillor Mejia, for you know kickstarting this conversation, um, um, as you mentioned earlier. Um, my name is Brianna Malore. I'm the Chief of Community Engagement, and I have the pleasure of serving Boston's constituency alongside the, uh, the Community Engagement Cabinet. My cabinet consists of four departments, 311, the Office of Civic Organizing, Spark Boston, and the Office of Neighborhood Services. These departments are centered around people, so accessibility and connectivity is always at the forefront of everything we do. Um, like many people around the world, the COVID-19 pandemic forced us to reimagine the ways we stay connected with our families, our friends, our jobs, employees, and with our community. Um, one of the top priorities of the administration and the Community Engagement Cabinet is to get City Hall out of City Hall. And what better way to do that um, in this very digital world and, um, than through making sure that we can provide remote access that our constituents can make sure to stay connected with City Hall. The remote access the Community Engagement Cabinet has been able to connect with Boston's residents, um, community, organizing, community organizations, um, and also our most vulnerable um, constituencies as well. Today, I speak directly to how remote capacity increases accessibility to city, to city resources, not only to city staff, but um, to our most impactful um, constituencies um, across the city. I've witnessed firsthand the impacts of that. Extending uh, remote access ensures that the city of Boston can reach our most vulnerable and sometimes our hard to reach communities, including seniors, young people, um, and our disabled community as well, um, who, live on their, who live on their computers, phones, and those who have uh, mobility challenges, or maybe hearing impaired or visually impaired, 
or just everyday families that are juggling work and other personal responsibilities that may impact their participation um, in their communities or community meetings, or just um, a way to stay connected outside of their homes. So remote access is crucial for Boston's constituencies to ensure the community stays informed and civically engaged and connected to the city. And it's also a very timely discussion as we as we see the, um, the governors uh, extend um, have the extension to um, March of 2025 um, of remote access. So thank you for having me and I look forward to um, engaging further. I also will be have to hop off at um, 3 p.m. Just want to uh, let everyone know that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Malore and, and Councillor Arroyo. Uh, my name is Andrea Patton. Um, it is Andrea, unless I am hablando en español. Uh, but I am the Chief of Staff for the Mayor's Commission for Persons with Disabilities, uh, Department of the City of Boston, led, of course, by uh, Commissioner Kristen McCosh. So I want to thank the, the committee for inviting the department for inviting me to speak today about the importance of remote access to public meetings, specifically for people with disabilities. For those who may not know, uh, the mission of our department is to increase opportunities for people with disabilities by facilitating the full and equal participation in all aspects of life within the city of Boston. So we work to reduce architectural, procedural, attitudinal, and communication barriers, uh, particularly when it comes to city programs and civic activities. And remote access has long been important to the disability community, whether that's the uh, push for uh, remote employment, even before the pandemic, uh, or the opportunity to provide testimony to, to this body, to the city council, among others, over Zoom. The COVID-19 pandemic was and continues to be an immense tragedy uh, for our society, but especially for many members of the disability community. The community was most heavily impacted, uh, one of the most heavily impacted, both by the disease and by our you know, necessary response to it that led to a, a large amount of social isolation. One positive development, however, was, of course, the broad acceptance and implementation of remote work and remote access to government uh, that the community has long wanted. Remote participation can be beneficial to people with all kinds of disabilities for different reasons. For people with mobility disabilities, it can be much easier to attend from home where you know everything's going to be physically accessible to you. You don't have to run the risk that an accessibility feature at a venue is broken, like a chairlift, or that inadequate accessible transportation options will make you miss the meeting. For people with sensory processing disorders, which can be common among people with cognitive and developmental disabilities, you can attend the meeting from an environment where you have greater control over things like noise level, lighting, or other potentially uh, dif difficult aspects in an unknown venue. Because everyone is actually speaking into their device's microphone, uh, and it's coming out of the, the speakers of the device that you're using to attend the meeting, hard of hearing individuals can control volume and better understand spoken information, unlike at in-person events where an attendee might decline to use a microphone that's provided. And of course, immunocompromised people such as myself can attend meetings without risking contracting a severe illness. But there are challenges to a fully virtual environment as well. Different video conferencing platforms have varying levels of compatibility with screen readers, which makes some virtual meetings essentially inaccessible to the blind and low vision community. Across all platforms, screen readers cannot access the text on a slideshow that's being shown using a screen share function, uh, and so that text is not accessible uh, if that's the only way it's being provided. Structure and social cues can sometimes be harder to read and understand in a virtual environment, which might make them more difficult for neurodivergent individuals. And of course, not everyone has access to personal computers, smartphones, or stable internet connections that are required for remote participation, especially for those living uh, on a fixed income. That's why hybrid options are really considered the gold standard. Uh, in our department, we've polled our community when it comes to events that we're hosting, and it pretty much always comes back 50-50. When we brought back our disability community forum last May, we had 40 people join us in person and 40 people join us on Zoom. Our office is also the administrative staff for the Disability Commission Advisory Board. This board is made up of 13 Boston residents appointed by the mayor who advise our department and really the city on issues of concern to the disability community. 
and advocate for policies at the local, state, and even national level that improve lives of people with disabilities. The board holds monthly meetings, and they are one of the commissions that is subject to open meeting laws. And I do mention this first because the board has been discussing for months their desire to see remote participation remain an option for all public meetings. They've been tracking both the status of this legislation and the legislation at the state level, uh, the supplemental funding that, that temporarily extended this and some legislation that would make this permanent uh, under the open meeting law. But I also mention our board meetings because I know the added difficulty of having a hybrid public meeting rather than having a fully virtual or a fully in-person meeting. It essentially requires the staff and resources of two meetings, someone to manage the virtual meeting, directing the virtual component, managing the technology, and someone to manage the location and the in-person. It requires that you have the right technology in place, cameras in the room so that virtual attendees can see the in-person meeting, microphones in that room so virtual attendees can hear everyone, speakers in the room so that in-person attendees can hear the virtual attendees and, and vice versa. You, you all know very well, I know the council has hybrid meetings regularly. Uh, but it's particularly important when you're thinking about language access um, and uh, access for people with disabilities who may need to see uh, more or hear more uh, than someone who doesn't have a disability. And so our meetings are held on Zoom and in room 801 of Boston City Hall, and they're broadcast on Boston City TV. And I just want to shout them out because it is thanks to the incredible support of that team that we're able to run and manage a, a hybrid meeting. And I know that not all of the boards and commissions uh, that we have in the city operate in that way. And so I'll close there uh, just by saying that on behalf of Commissioner McCosh, we really look forward to working with all of you uh, to develop a procedure for the city of Boston, all of our public meetings to be open accessible to all of our residents. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if the, uh, if we should go straight to our advocate panel so that counselors can ask questions of both sides of this. I know we have a hard stop at three uh, for the chief and, and for, Andrea, so I don't know if there's if there's any questions specifically for them. Otherwise, I could go straight to our advocate panel. Thank you both for your testimony um, and for your, your very important points. I think, um, Mr. Chair, um, I had a, a few uh, questions about, um, I know a few years ago, uh, if, if the city had uh, conducted a needs assessment to review the technological conditions of uh, sitting hall hearing rooms and conference rooms to identify the need for uh, equipment upgrades uh, to support a permanent remote access. I know that was something that was sort of put out there. I, I just don't know if we ever had that audit of, of uh, existing conditions. And uh, then we also, in terms of the, the number of the five meeting rooms that uh, Apparently, there are five meeting rooms that are equipped with uh, television production utilizing robotic cameras uh, that were referenced in a, a 2020 um, RFP for Do It. Um, and I'm just curious about where those where those meeting rooms are. Uh, and then I know last year we we uh, because we were we were advocating for this um, this legis this ordinance. Uh, we did put it in the but suggested put it in the budget last year to fit out two of the meeting rooms in the city council, uh, the Curley room and the Piemonte room, so that uh, um, uh, our residents could remotely uh, observe uh, and participate in uh, working sessions as well. That was the um, that was another reason for uh, that supplemental budget request that we put in last year. Uh, but those are really just my questions in terms of, okay, um, what, what sort of infrastructure have we got and what upgrades do we need? And that may not be a question that, we, that the administration can answer today, but it's just a question I want to put on the record. Thank you, Councillor Brayden. Uh, if either of you are able to answer any, of, any part of that question today? Yeah, thank you, Councilor Braden and Councilor Royo. Um, I know that the Department of Innovation and Technology and Property Management uh, were looking into exactly those pieces the last time um, the state's temporary uh, extension expired for 
about 48 hours actually. Um, so I know there was work done to look at not only meeting rooms in city hall, but in other city buildings like the bowling building. Um, so I know an accounting of that started at least the last time the state um, was looking at an expiration, but I don't have those numbers. So we would have to follow up with you for specifics. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to do that, Councilor Brennan, make sure we get answers to those questions. Do you have anything else for, for the for the administration that you'd like to get on record or anything you'd like to ask? Um, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Thank you. Councilor Brayden. Obviously, if anything comes later, we can we can handle making sure that that gets sent over. Um, Councilor Louis Jen, then Council President Flynn, then Councilor Mejia, uh, if you have any questions in that order. Thank you, Chair. Um, I I have one question, I think, or maybe more than one, but one question to start for administration. Is there a best practice for virtual engagement, like chat features or communications or making sure that, you know, you can see everyone who's in the room? Is there like a, a policy on, on, on how we'll, uh, on how we should engage community virtually? Uh, thank you for that question. So the, the policies that the open meeting law policies that um, this would apply to, or um, they're, they kind of all function in different formats um, in the sense of like the ZBA might function in a different, like a different way than the BPDA board or something like that. Um, but we all make sure we were like, we all make sure that the, dis the dis disability commission has like kind of guidelines about like closed captioning and uh, also LCA has the access to language access. So all those are um, kind of stipulation for language access and um, access for the disabilities community. Um, so those are kind of the guidelines that each kind of remote meeting has to follow. Um, outside of that, um, they're like, they might use different platforms like WebEx or Zoom, but yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't know if Andrea has to add anything to that. I would just say, uh, yes, uh, uh, LCA and our office have definitely put together um, both sort of expected requirements, um, but also best practices for virtual um, engagement. My sort of shortest uh, best piece of advice is more options are better. Someone might be able to, you know, navigate and click the raise hand function, but if that's the only way that you're allowing people to be recognized, you might miss folks who, who aren't able to do that. So generally speaking, we always say sort of more options are better so that people can use what works for them. Okay, thank you. And I think I'm probably, when I'm thinking about this issue, it comes up more in the BPDA meetings where you actually aren't able to engage or see who's in the room or in Zoom. So I think that's something for us to, to take into um, consideration. Um, has there been an analysis or study of the virtual meeting platforms that allow or don't allow certain meeting functionality? like? Zoom versus Teams, where in some instances one might be better than another? Not to my knowledge, but I'm sure um, we can follow up if there's an actual answer, a more concrete answer to that. Yeah, and is there one that's like better for making sure that our disabled community is included and um, is, is, is able to participate um, to the fullest extent possible? There's no one that is um, considered the best or, or the best one. Um, I'd be happy to follow up. The Mass Office on Disability, their annual meeting this past year was specifically about this and they had representatives from Zoom and Teams and like six different platforms to kind of show off all their accessibility features. So the state agencies may have some uh, more guidance on accessibility across features, uh, but they've all done so much work in the pandemic to fix bugs and make improvements. Um, I think they're all miles better than they were in 2019, to be honest. Okay. Um, and then just in terms of like making sure that we're equipped here in City Hall to be able to meet what we want to do, which is like permanent hybrid options. Have we identified what City Hall areas in the city are uh, like need equipment upgrades to make sure that we're able to, to execute the way that we want to? I know that the Department of Innovation and Technology and Property Management have started um, a survey of those spaces, not just in City Hall, but also other city buildings. Um, they started the last time the state uh, 
temporary thing was expiring, so I don't know the status of it, um, but I know we can chat with uh, Chantal and follow up. Great, and then this is my last question, and uh, this will also be for the advocates. Um, but like, when you, have you, like, what is the feedback you hear, or do you hear feedback from community about the strengths and weaknesses of, of, of our remote meetings or hybrids? Like, what are the, um, what are the things that you hear from community that need improvement that maybe is not getting to us or that we don't want to hear about? Yeah, I think the core of community engagement is always making sure you're taking feedback um, and um, remote access and creating space has always been um, a topic of that. So um, we are we are constantly um, getting feedback on, you know, how do we formulate meetings? Like how are we, um, how are we structuring them, et cetera? So um, there's no formal mechanism right now to kind of um, collect that information, but it's a lot of a lot. It's a anecdotal in a, in a sense. So some of the things that we hear about, may, maybe to your uh, mentioned earlier, of like you know wanting to see each other, like it helps. It's helpful to know like who is in the room. Um, I think that's probably the most um, common one I hear. Um, and then you know raising your hand, like. Sometimes maybe like the order might go out of whack and stuff like that, which is like a, tech, a technological um, thing. So um, we are definitely making sure that um, we're making our spaces as accessible um, as possible and people f can feel connected. So um, looking through um, platforms to make that happen. Um, but I would definitely say um, that seeing each other, seeing each other's faces, who else is on the call, probably the most one that comes up the most. Okay, and I, I, it feels like your department does a good job of that unless, and like like the city hall, mm -hmm. uh, not, like, not including VPA for this part of the discussion does a pretty good job at that definitely. unless I may have missed something. No, definitely, the, the ZBA, like for example, the ZBA, which is also not in my cabinet, but um, the, what the ZBA, which I cabinet interacts with the most, does use Zoom, which they are able to kind of see more um, of each other, especially if they like have the panelist option. So um, that has also been um, a practice um, that's helpful, and we got great feedback from residents that are coming to testify. It's helpful to know like who else is testifying, um, stuff like that. Great, and but you, you don't get feedback, or you haven't heard a lot about public notice being an issue. Like I didn't know this meeting was happening. Like where's the link posted or like sometimes they have to register right first before getting the link so just wanting to know if you hear anything about that myself personally no but i can make sure to check in with my team to see about the registration piece um the other um yes the other piece to this is um we would love to make sure that anything that the council is hearing as well if we the way we can making sure that we are getting all the information as possible to make our, our public meetings as accessible as possible. But if you are if you are hearing that, we'd love to make sure we're addressing those concerns for community members. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Council President Flynn uh, and then Councillor Mejia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And one of the one of the questions I have is, as we go into as we go into the budget phase here with the with the mayor and the city council, and maybe the question is to to the chief or to the or to uh, Commissioner McCosh, but are we able to allocate funding for persons with disabilities that might need? upgrades to their computer system that might need technical assistance, that might need um, <clears throat> digital equity assistance? And if so, are we able to factor that in now as we go forward during the budget and allocate some funding to address any challenges that might that we might see in the future? Thank you so much for that question, Councillor Flynn. Um, I do know that the, uh, again, Department of Innovation and Technology 
There is a digital equity fund. Um, I don't know the details on it since, again, it, not not in my department, but I do know there is an existing fund at the city to assist um, with bringing down internet prices, uh, things like that. I also think that's that question is part of why the hybrid options are so important, um, that if someone doesn't have um, you know, technology at their home, that there is still a place, you know, here in City Hall, here in the People's Building, that they can come and, and interact uh, in person. So, yeah, digital equity is definitely very important to us, um, and I, the only fund that I know about lives and do it. Thank, thank you, Andrea. And, and maybe as we go forward over the next two weeks, maybe we can have a discussion with the City of Boston's um, budget people to see if there might be an opportunity to um, figure out, do, a, do an assessment, do an assessment on what we might need to help persons with disabilities and allocate funding. So I'd be glad to work with whoever wants to be part of that. But I think that's that's a part of it because certainly, certainly we support um, access for persons with disabilities but we want to make sure the financial means are also there so that they can actually go ahead and participate in, in money should not be an, op, an obstacle. So that was my that was my number one issue. And then my second one is going back to my original opening statement. And maybe maybe my colleagues might not like this, but but here goes. Um, <clears throat> Would what what would prevent a remote hearing from happening where city councilors don't have to? Would this pre, would this allow city councilors to do their remote hearings from their homes and not not in the in their offices or or in the Ionella chamber? I should say. Do we know the answer to that? Is that like a question for the administration? Maybe, maybe to the chair, um, I, I, or whoever might have an answer on it. Uh, thank you, Councilor Brayden, as, as the original sponsor. Councilor Flynn, I think that this really applies to um, um, commissions, boards and commissions in the city, you know, um, and, and for opportunities for uh, the public to uh, listen and participate in boards and commissions of, uh, in the city. I think uh, there still is a requirement for the actual staff at the, um, let's say, the, 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 um, the ZBA. The requirement is that the ZBA board are there in person together, but that the public can participate remotely. So I think it's really, uh, uh, it's really to promote access for the community to boards and commissions and the and the deliberations of government in the city, uh, I still think um, the um, the remote meeting. Um, I think your concern is that none of, that, that that the city councillors would be having uh, having hearings and that uh, we would be doing it remotely. It seems that you know really the focus of this legislation is to look at at uh, recognizing that there are a huge number of boards and commissions in the city, I think there's about 60 of them, and that uh, the public has to have, uh, uh, we really just want to expand access to those uh, those meetings for the, for the public who may not otherwise be able to participate because of uh, caretaking responsibilities, job schedules, um, uh, disabilities, etc. So, you know, I think you, you know, it's a valid concern for you, from you, but I think this 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 ordinance is specifically targeted at, at boards and boards and commissions. No, I, I understand. Thank you, Council Brandon. But I also know it is it is an ongoing discussion here at the City Council of of remote access and, and having as much uh, remote access hearings as we can. So certainly. Certainly, it, I think the hybrid, the hybrid option for remote participation, like we had a hearing this morning, uh, we had remote access for folks who wish to make public testimony. And again, I think that's a, that's something that is very um, conducive to expanding uh, 
community participation in the deliberations of, of our city council hearings when we invite in um, public testimony as part of the of the hearing then offering a hybrid option as you said um, uh, it is sort of the gold standard in terms of public participation yeah thank thank you council Bray. um chief do we know is the bpda i know the hearings are are, are remote but are they also um, is the public invited to the BPDA hearings um, up at the ninth floor as well? Um, like, are they like in a hybrid model? Yeah. I don't actually know the answer to that, um, but I'm pretty sure they're all remote, like the same way the ZBAR is. So, so the public can't, the public, if they, they want to participate, go yeah, they can participate virtually. If the public physically wants to go to a BPDA hearing, they they could not do that. I would have to check on that. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I think, I mean, my my opinion. I think, I think it's time for them to open up and um, have public hearings. Certainly, having having them hybrid, having them where the public can watch them over the over the internet. But but I think they need to be in public now. Um, okay. Does anybody from the administration have a better, a better? Um, do they? Does anyone else have an idea on what, what the status is going forward of of, of the BPDA? I, I mean, I believe they're going to continue with their virtual options, and I could definitely give um, the feedback to. Um, Chief Jemison and uh, about the what your concerns, um, President, um, Council President. Okay, because I, I also think we I also think we lose something when we don't meet in public, and we don't we don't get that one on one engagement with residents prior to a meeting, after a meeting. And and I and I think it does it does impact our ability to do to do our job. I like I like the in person meeting, um, and then access for for the public. Um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the thank you to my colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Uh, Councillor Mejia. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. So just a few questions. Um, I am seeking a little bit of clarity. So it sounds like um, uh, through the chair uh, to the makers that this is specific to boards and commissions, not the public hearings that we host on the council. It seems like I just want to make sure that I am that I'm participating in the right conversation and that my questions are specific to to that. So could I just gain some clarity? Just want to make sure because I'm hearing two different things and I want to make sure that I'm leading in in the way that makes the most sense, y'all. So could somebody just confirm or deny that for me, please? Yeah, I think it applies to boards and commissions. Okay. We already offer a um, hybrid option to remote participation in our, in our um, committee meetings here. And is that going to stay after the mayor, after the governor's uh, March 31st? Yes. All right. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about, uh, thank you for that, Councillor Breeden. Let's talk a little bit about language access. Um, we, you know, we've, we're, we've been talking about um, just being able to uh, be engaged. And I'm just curious in terms of how, how we're thinking about the component of making sure that all of our um, meetings are accessible, whether it's in person or, or hybrid or virtually, that there is a language access component. Can you just talk through that? Because we want to make sure that we're set up for success. And I know, Chief Malora, you and I have talked about how important it is to make sure that the interpretation and language um, is available in all all spaces and places. But we, as on the council, don't have the capacity to do it because we don't have the budget. So can you talk in your ideal world? This is the opportunity for us to dream big and envision what is possible. Um, what would that look like in order for us to really ensure that we're, we're setting ourselves up for success 
from a language and information justice standpoint with accessibility for multiple languages. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Thank you for your question, Counselor. So yeah, language access is at, always at the forefront of our minds, specifically with Warden and Commissions. Um, requesting language is something that you can always do. Um, we also have the capability to like on the spot to do translations as well. That's a, that is something that the um, city has access to, for example. Um, if you're in like talking to a constituent and maybe they're like, trying to you're trying to understand what they're saying that's something that you can do on the spot but yes yeah, so boards and commissions when we're talking about accessibility um that is that is always lca is always at the forefront of those conversations even translations of um notices and notifications as well so um yeah and i think as we as we kind of have as we kind of have deeper in these conversations we want to make sure that um accessibility with language is always at, at the forefront so yeah that. And I'm curious, um, you know, as in the world of virtual reality, sometimes you just never know who's real and who's not. And I'm just curious, there are a lot of meetings that happen um, where you have these stakeholders or, or butters or people who, who are claiming to be part of a neighborhood. Are there any checks and balances that you can think of when, when we're hosting virtual meetings and people are signing up for public testimony to speak? What what kind of guardrails are you will you need to consider to ensure that, let's say for instance, in Dorchester there's a, a a community meeting and the people the 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 folks that show up don't even live in Dorchester, but they're signed up to to speak. Um, and we see this in person, but I'm just curious if we're moving into a virtual world, what are some of the ways that you might be able to make sure that, that the people who are signing up to speak are from that neighborhood and that are they are considered a stakeholder? So uh, specifically on the conversation of like boards and commissions when they're holding public spaces, because I think there's like two kind of two separate conversations because there's like, I don't know if you're referencing like a butters meetings, which is like a different process is a different it doesn't like fall under what this ordinance will cover um but if we're talking about largely like the public meetings that we have in general then um we also are cognizant of not limiting participation civically um as well so um if you're talking specifically about like a butters meetings, that's a different kind of process. So I, I don't know if clarification. Yeah, so, so, I'll give you, so I'll, yeah. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify a little bit more. So I participated in one of the, uh, um, you know, we established the Black Men's Commission here in the city of Boston, and we participated in some of their community listening sessions and things of that nature, right? So that, that's a commission. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of folks who um, have really good intentions, but may not be from Boston. But, but are occupying space and commenting in those spaces that help inform the commission's work. So that is what I'm trying to get at is if it's in a virtual space, what, what how are you able to track? How would you be able to track, you know, if they are a, a key stakeholder, if they are like proximity to the issue, do they even live in Boston? Yeah. Because that's also an issue that I see with a lot of boards and commissions that not everybody lives in the city of Boston, but yet they are making decisions about the lives of those who do. So I'm just curious mm. about what that looks like on a virtual world. Honestly, and that's a good question, Counselor. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm happy to follow up. No, I, I, I appreciate that. I just think that, you know, people, uh, there's a sentiment here, right, that uh, we're not being heard and it's, things are always being done to us without us. And that's why I'm so incredibly encouraged by the leadership and the administration and how hard you all are working to uh, be in constant community and in communication with folks. So I, I really do see the, the shift. I just want to make sure that whatever we can do on the council to help ensure that you have the right budget, that you're thinking about your staffing, that you're thinking about the technology, that you're thinking about all of these things so that we can be as supportive as, as possible as really what I'm trying to gain some insight. Mm -hmm. And then the last question that I have, because I know you all have a hard stop, um, is is as you as you think about this particular issue around access, I, I think I've, I'm hearing a lot around um, accessibility and disability, but I'm also going to just amplify, you know, as a single mom, 
um, and someone who worked in the education space um, and who grew up with an undocumented mom, it is really important for us to make sure that accessibility, when we're thinking about boards and commissions or whatever the case is, is that we are removing as many barriers as possible so that people can be participating in democracy, right? This is about digital democracy and opportunities for people to be heard. And so I just want to just uplift that it, accessibility is one, but I also just think that, you know, there's a level of class um, and issues of just privilege that sometimes we don't think of when we're having these conversations. And that the last thing that I'll say is that not, not everybody knows how to read and write. And that's why it's so important to have these sort of type of environments so that people can, can, can hear and, and, and understand what is happening it is also incredibly important. So that's not a question, that's just me uh, uh, politicking out here. So that is all for me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Councillor uh, uh, do you mind if I just make one comment on the uh, interpretation yep. piece? Um, thank you, Councillor Mejia, for raising that. Um, yes, we talk a lot about disability accessibility for obvious reasons. We're the Disabilities Commission, um, but disability it is every you know intersects with every race, every gender, every social class, um, and and we definitely want to make sure our meetings are accessible to everyone. Um, a note on interpretation. Um, Remote access has made it a lot easier to schedule interpreters. This is especially true of ASL, um, but hybrid also makes the logistics of that a little more complicated um, or and or more expensive, right? You either need a spoken language interpreter on the Zoom and one in person, um, or you need to have the right technology to make sure that the in-person people can see the interpreter on Zoom. So it's just, it's an important one and it's something that our office, the Office of Language and Communications Access, the Equity Cabinet as a whole is here to support every board and commission with. Um, but hybrid, again, being the gold standard, uh, but also you got a little work a little bit harder sometimes to reach the gold standard, right? You got to put in more time and more money and more resources to reach it. So um, that's a great point. Thank you for we're raising it. Persuading. We're here to support um, and, and to make sure we're doing it in a thoughtful and equitable way across all boards and commissions. So thank you. Thank you for answering that. Uh, and adding that, I don't know if anybody has anything else for the administration before they sat at three o'clock stop, hard stop. So it's actually, this is like perfect timing. So I'm not sure if anybody else has anything else for them that we can't send them later, but now is that time. And you're free. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and let you go. Thank you so uh, much, counselors. Thank, thank you. you. We're gonna go to uh, our advocate panel now. Um, I'm gonna reintroduce you and then you can uh, take it from there. Uh, we are joined today by Kate Crawford, Director uh, of Technology for Liberty Program for, AC for the ACLU of Massachusetts, Rick Glassman, the Director of Advocacy for the Disability Law Center, Jeff Foster, the Executive Director for Common Cause Massachusetts, and Daniela DePina, who is a peer advocate for the Boston Center for Independent Living. And so I'm going to allow you all to have opening statements. Um, we can go in the order of names mentioned, so we could start with uh, Kate Crawford. Great, uh, thank you very much, Chair. It's really nice to be here. First, I just wanna express my gratitude for living in the city of Boston. This is a city where all of our leaders, uh, elected and appointed, are committed to accessibility, transparency, and democratic access. And it is really a breath of fresh air uh, to be part of a process like this one, particularly given what we see going on in other parts of the country where um, other government officials are attacking democracy and making it more difficult for people to participate. Um, as many people have already said, the pandemic showed us what remote access offers. So many people who had previously been shut out of the democratic process were suddenly able to participate and to do so relatively easily. People with small children at home, people with elder, elder care responsibilities, folks working multiple jobs, people with disabilities and so many other groups, including me, I fit into none of those categories, but it was really nice um, to be able to tune into government meetings like school you know, school committee meetings and, and voice my, uh, my views on issues while I was cooking dinner, for example. Um, we know that when more people are part of the conversation, we get to better solutions to advance the public interest and quality of life in our communities. And so it's really wonderful to see a commitment from this body to extending that remote access. 
We are also very happy that the legislature and the governor extended the emergency remote access provisions in the recent supplemental budget that was signed just yesterday. Um, that extension gives us more time to hash out what a permanent change to the state open meeting law should look like and to ensure municipal governments like Boston's have the funds that they need to get everybody the access they need to be a part of the conversation. So our coalition, you're gonna hear from a bunch of us today, is supporting legislation that would permanently amend the open meeting law at the state level to provide for hybrid access. And if any of you would like to help us try to get that bill passed, please let me know. Um, we would love your support. At the same time though, Boston does not need to and shouldn't wait for the state to make those permanent changes. We have the opportunity to lead and to work out rules for the city that put us on firm footing to ensure that we're doing everything possible to give everyone access to be involved in our local democratic process. And it seems to me that there's a broad consensus on the council that this ordinance is a good idea. So I don't think we're gonna have to do a whole lot of work convincing people that we should pass an ordinance like this. Like with many uh, issues, the, the trick is gonna be getting the details right. So I wanna acknowledge the comments made by Andrea Patton about the logistical complexities of hybrid meetings and also her view that they are the gold standard. We agree, it's the ACLU's position and our coalition's position that hybrid meetings are the best approach. We also value what physical presence can offer in these processes, so, you know, something echoed as well by Council President Flynn. And we wanna make sure that people have uh, the option to either show up in person or to make their, ver their, their voice heard online. So towards that end, we are very much looking forward to participating in a working session on this legislation. We wanna make sure we're dotting all our I's and crossing our T's. And as Council President Flynn said, we also wanna make sure the city has uh, the funds allocated properly to facilitate true open meetings. Um, so, you know, we'd look forward to being a part of budget conversations if that would be helpful as well. Um, Boston is always a leader in our state and we are confident that we can arrive at language that's agreeable to everyone involved and ensures the city is ready to offer full accessibility to all our residents on an ongoing and permanent basis. So I'll just close by saying thank you. Um, again, President. it's really a pleasure to be a part of this process. Very grateful to the sponsors. Uh, thank you, Chair Arroyo. Thank you, Council President Flynn. We look forward to getting this over the finish line as soon as possible, and we are happy to be a resource to the city and to the ad administration as we move this legislation forward. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Rick Glassman is next. Good afternoon. I'm Rick Glassman. I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Disability Law Center. Uh, my thanks to the Chair and uh, the Council President and the sponsors and other members of the Council that have put forward this important measure. I, I wanted this afternoon to just very quickly tell you my favorite story about the importance of remote public participation. I'm working with Boston Center for Independent Living and some other disability justice advocates on state legislation re related to people who use wheelchairs who are stuck at home for weeks or months at a time because our system for fixing wheelchairs is broken, our warranty laws need to be improved, and so on. And during the last legislative session at the committee hearing on our bill, we had a wheelchair user testify in support of the bill from the parking lot of Home Depot. Well, why was he there? He was on his shift at work. Uh, this is a person who's a wheelchair user working at Home Depot. And he was able during his break to roll out into the parking lot, get on Zoom, and participate and testify in support of this legislation and tell his story. This is a person who's an African immigrant. He didn't uh, have the resources to just be able to take a day off of work. And he probably wouldn't have been able to find readily available to him accessible transportation to get all the way into onto Beacon Hill uh, and, you know, and lose a work day. And so as the slogan goes, this is what democracy looks like. This is what we've been able to accomplish in spite of all the other terrible things that COVID has brought, um, as has already been said, there are so many people, and it's not just people with disabilities able to talk about disability issues, it's people with disabilities able to talk about anything in the public sector that affects them, and other people who um, really lack the resources, the privilege, um, the, 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 the ability to have childcare or, uh, you know, people who are, are managing child care, uh, child care or caretaking responsibilities who have poor transportation options. All of this creates uh, a, a situation where 
through universal design, those people are able to participate. Uh, and this is what our, um, our friend Diana Hu, who is the chair of Boston Center for Independent Living and is a Google software engineer and a wheelchair user, she's coined the phrase ramps 2.0. Um, and if she were able to be here today, she would explain this is really a whole new way in which people can participate in the decisions uh, that are being made on their behalf. So uh, I, I think this bill merits your strong support. A couple little technical notes and then I'll stop. Uh, one is uh, in response to um, uh, the council president, I wanted to note that Section 1.18.3a really says, as to the members of the body themselves, that is decided by essentially by the open meeting law. And so it doesn't lower the bar there. We also think it's important that people be able uh, to speak in person when they're able to do so. The problem is not everybody can, but we think the availability of, of members of the public body in person is important. Um, I also wanted to uh, appreciate the comments by Andrea Patton about uh, it's not just if, but how, really, it's how we use the technology. And in 1.18.3b, um, there is uh, language that talks about using this in a way to provide equal opportunity and reasonable access in how you use the, the technology. And finally, in response to uh, Councillor Mejia, um, uh, that same section addresses persons requiring language interpretation or translation services. I think all of those are strengths of this measure. Um, and I think uh, in some, this is uh, a chance to communicate back to the public who we are, what we stand for, for about equity and inclusion uh, and having a stronger community and bringing in more voices Then we need to develop the ground rules and the guardrails that are going to make that level of public participation possible. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here and thank you for supporting this. Thank you uh, for your opening as well. Uh, and I think we are now going to Jeff Foster. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Arroyo. And thank you to all the sponsors uh, for your work on this particular docket, uh, but really also to echo my colleagues, such a great discussion already today. It's been great to just hear. Uh, my name is Jeff Foster, he, him. I'm the executive director at Common Cause Massachusetts. We're a 50 year old good government democracy advocacy group. Uh, we've been based in Boston the whole time, uh, but I'm also here today to represent our nearly 1600 members who live in Boston uh, in support uh, of the docket today. Uh, again, as others have mentioned, when the pandemic began, it forced us to rethink how to maintain the adequate level of access and transparency that people had come to expect of their government. Uh, and we celebrated at the temporary expansion offered uh, to the open meeting law, which as we heard was just extended for another two years. Uh, we saw municipalities like Boston use this expansion to its fullest. Uh, and we see the continued commitment to equity and access in today's docket. Uh, the win, the big win, is in hybrid. Uh, it'll give people who want to participate in their government the power to choose to either attend in person or remote. Uh, it's our collective priority in this coalition to see this level of equitable access made permanent. Uh, and we're really hopeful uh, that the legislature will do just that this session, uh, but we're excited in our advocacy to be able to point to the great leadership in the city of Boston for what the gold standard can look like. Um, we are committed to working with you all to, to get to the gold standard. Um, but again, you know, the hybrid access to all bodies subject to the open meeting law would be really big for our democracy. You know, longstanding barriers, have, as have already been referenced, uh, will be removed. Uh, and people will have the power to choose their means of engagement in a way that works for them and their families. You could think it's really important to go all the way down the T to City Hall, to show up in person and to run into a city councilor uh, in the hallway and have that one-on-one. -on -one. Or maybe what you need is to just put your kids down for a few minutes in front of a Bluey episode uh, and jump on your phone to testify real quick. But again, this is really good. It's good for government to meet people where they're at. This is the 21st century. I can go online real quick and buy my, my movie seat and in five minutes go inside and sit down. So I think it's time to make sure that level of technology is added to our democratic process. Lastly, I just wanna flag that the timing is right. Uh, we've seen a huge over billion dollar investment recently by the federal government into broadband equity and access. 
Boston, I'm sure, like many other municipalities across the state, are already working on their digital equity plans uh, as we're talking right now. So this is a great opportunity to lean into those resources uh, to, to make hybrid permanent. Also, last session, the legislature indicated its strong support for municipal IT infrastructure and the resources needed to do remote access meetings by including a $30 million bond authorization uh, in a governmental bond bill. Now, regrettably, Governor Baker vetoed that bond authorization, but we're really excited to work with the legislature again to reauthorize it this session. Uh, in closing, again, let me just say thank you for today's meeting, uh, for your leadership on the issue. Uh, we're hopeful that hybrid public access to Boston's municipal meetings will be here to stay. Uh, it's a win for an informed electorate. It's a win for an elected body like you all. Uh, and most importantly, it's a win for democracy. Thanks again. Thank you, uh, Daniela DePina, and then I'll go uh, to the sponsors for questions. Good afternoon. My name is Daniela DePina. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you for this meeting. It is very important with persons with disability to have the opportunity to have voice and to have freedom and a freedom to choose. Um, like I said, my name is Daniela DiPina. I'm from Dorchester. I work at the Boston Center for Independent Living as a peer advocate. I am also a single mom of four kids and my disability is visually impaired. Um, as you all know, we all been talking about the pandemic and the huge hole it had on us when it came. We all had to navigate our life to figure out what tools to use and how to support each other and how to support consumers. That was the question for me, as I am an advocate for persons with disability. As we became using the Zoom, um, it really didn't hurt our consumers. We will still be able to support them and advocate for them. Consumer was still was able to achieve their independent living goal. We will still be able to participate in the community, like being in a state house. We um, celebrate the ADA on Zoom. Our voice was louder than ever, and I particip participate on them as many times. As much as we look at the pandemic and what it taught us, yes, the pandemic did have some negative effects, but it did have some positive effects, and that is being hybrid and be able to use Zoom. Like I said, my name is Daniela DePina. I have four kids as a single mom, and I also work at the Boston Center for Independent Living. I commute to, from Dorchester to downtown every day. Um, and it's hard. My youngest daughter is eight years old. I often had the anxiety because I rely on the ride. And as all you know, how difficult it is with the ride. It doesn't always bring you home on time. So I constantly have the anxiety if I'm going to be here on time to get my eight years old out of the after school program. I also have a disability son who I um, monitor his medication daily and often go to work with the anxiety if he's okay when I'm not home. With that said and done, as we look at um, the pandemic, it's mostly important to understand and know the importance of choose have a, of having a choice, of having a choice, whether to be in remote or to be in person. Now we have the tools, the tools that we could use and uh, for persons with disability that could use as to what accommodate them. I know one of the council shared about the difficulties of having a Zoom that sometimes like the platform doesn't work or the link doesn't work or the um, slideshow doesn't work. And I am in the agreement with you because that happens to me so many times. But this is the importance of having a choice and knowing that I'm going to have a meeting in two weeks. What link are they using? What software are they using? Can I be in person or can I be at home? But that and say, I have a choice. And most importantly, the consumers and advocacy, we're asking to have a choice, a choice to either be remote in person 
so we could voice our choice, either in remote or in person. Thank you again for allowing me to speak today. No, thank you for being here today and making this a uh, space that you prioritize. So thank you uh, very much for your time. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, our original sponsors first, starting with Councillor Braden, then going to Councillor Louis Jen, then Councillor Flynn, then Councillor Mejia in that order. Uh, Councillor Braden, uh, we can start with you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Daniela just raised a, a few points that I think is really important to consider. Um, you know, having a choice is very important and knowing that you have a choice is, you don't have a choice if you don't know you have a choice. Uh, so publicly noticing these meetings, uh, it would be really important to make sure that uh, we state whether there is a remote access component to a meeting. Um, to specify whether public testimony will be taken, you know, wh whether it's just a, a viewing opportunity or whether it's actually an opportunity to, to weigh in in the conversation and whether testimony would be taken in person, remotely or in writing. Uh, and then also providing instructions on how to request disability and language access accommodations. All of these things are sort of the nuts and bolts of how we would actually have to make this work. And then indicate whether video recording minutes or transcripts are available after the meeting um, and where to find, where to request those and how to access those. Um, you know, I think it, it behooves us to really set a standard for how we want to continue to engage with folks with disabilities or seniors, people with limited access to transportation, and then people with work and family obligations who wouldn't otherwise be able to participate in our democracy in this way. So I think, you know, it's one thing to set it up, but then it's really important to communicate how to actually access all of all of this uh, proposal. So I really want to thank the advocates for, um, you know, keeping us, holding us accountable and keeping our feet to the fire on this one uh, in terms of just making sure that we come up with a, an a, a plan for a, a hybrid access to uh, these meetings that, that works for the folks on the ground, the, the end users, so to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brayden. Councillor Louis Jen. Hi, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, here, come in and clean. Okay, uh, on this meeting about remote access, I've been having access issues with my computer. I don't know if you're able to see me, but um, whatever, I'll, I'll just ask my questions. So I just want to thank all the advocates for being here. I think uh, what comes from Braden started getting into this, but I'm um, wondering if we know you know, I think in making sure strengthening um, the availability of meeting minutes or making recordings accessible is really important after these meetings happen, especially, you know, after these gold standard meetings happen, it happen of, of hybrid meetings. Um, do we know, have, have there been other cities or municipalities that have totally transitioned to hybrid meetings that are a good model for, for what we want to achieve? Um, just wanted to see if, if we've done any, if, if there's been any research towards what other folks have been doing and how, and how they've been getting this right. Well, I can uh, take a stab at that, Councillor. Um, I think the city of Boston's been doing great, honestly. Um, I think I think what we are really looking for is um, in this process is digging down a little bit more beyond the city council and the school committee, which are the two entities that um, you know I'm personally engaged with the most in Boston, and so I'm the most aware of. Um, to to learn a little bit more about what some of the boards and commissions have been up to, um, and to set some basic rules in place in the law so that no matter who's in charge of the city council, no matter who's in charge of the school committee, no matter who's running the various meetings of the boards and commissions, um, folks in Boston can you know expect that they'll have a consistent um, way of accessing. Uh, government meetings going forward. So I, I, I do think Boston has been doing a great job so far. Honestly, probably the best yeah. in the state that I'm aware of. Awesome. I wanted to make room if anybody else wanted to respond, but if not, um, I'll I'll go on to my 
uh, the second question. Uh, you know, President Flynn made a point about um, like an important part, and it is what I was also trying to get to. And opening remarks is an important part to public hearings. That's about um, meeting and talking to other people. So, do we know? And like, once a Zoom meeting ends, it ends, right? Like, you can't stay on to chit chat longer, or you can't, you know, do the work of like uh, really organizing with other. Um, uh, with other attendees, which I really do feel like is an important part to public meetings. And yes, it's really important that folks still have the ability to go in physically. But I'm wondering if there's a technology platform or anything that exists that would allow for this sort of, or a way of managing hybrid meetings that would allow for this community building that happens in person before after meeting to happen virtually. Uh, I know that might be a difficult question, but just really curious in terms of like trying to imagine what, you know, we strengthen a goal model, thinking about what community participation could look like, I think could be could be helpful. That's a really great point. And honestly, it's something that I haven't really thought about a whole lot. Um, I think the challenge there with a hybrid meeting is that um, as, an, as an official, right? Like if I wanted to talk to you after the meeting, Councillor Luijian, I, you know, I, you can only be in one place, right, at once. So it might be challenging <laughs> for you to manage trying to figure out how to talk to the people who are lined up physically in a meeting waiting to talk to you and, you know, trying to figure out how to talk to the folks who are waiting to chat with you online. So I think that's a really good question. I'm not sure how it would work in a hybrid meeting. I think with remote meetings, there are certainly ways that that could be done whether it's you know inviting folks into a Zoom room afterwards to you know to chit chat or you know you could set up like a Discord chat or something so that people could you know ask questions of of counselors or make follow up comments or something like that. Um, I will just say, and this is not exactly a response to your question, but it made me think of it that I've seen that there there are technologies that classrooms have been using, and this is to the cost question. There are technologies that, that I've seen in some classrooms, like at BU, I was at BU the other day, and they had something called an OWL device, which is basically like, it's like this big, maybe like a foot and a half tall and like, you know, maybe six inches diameter. And it is a microphone that also has cameras that move around the room. And it's one device that you can just, you know, plug and play basically. So I think that type of thing you know, maybe not necessarily that company's technology, but something like that could be a nice plug and play option for um, for boards that are trying to do hybrid meetings that don't have the capacity to set up in a room that has, you know, elaborate video conferencing uh, software or televisions or built in mics and cameras or something like that. So I think, you know, one of the things that I'm excited about in this process is figuring out whether it's through the working session or ongoing conversations with folks in the administration, what the existing technology needs are for different uh, boards and commissions and figuring out ways to, you know, get folks the technology that they need to make this goal that we all seem to share um, a possible reality uh, without breaking the bank. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, Kate. I think, I think that captures uh, most of my questions, you know, funny enough, when I asked the question, I wasn't thinking about members and community members wanting to talk to me as an elected official. I was really just thinking about community building among folks, because that's where a lot of the organizing can happen. That's where a lot of like, let's plan to do this. This the coalition building can happen. But good point. People also want to talk to their, and that would be that would be a difficult challenge. So I, I, I take that, and and I and I appreciate your comment, um, and I look forward to the working session. I want to thank. Um, Jeff, uh, Rick, and but Darlene, uh, oh, Daniela, for, for being here in addition uh, to you, Cade, um, and uh, look forward to the working session. Thank you. No, no further questions, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor uh, Flynn, and then Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel that participated. You're your testimony was very helpful, especially, I mean, everyone did an exceptional job, but especially Daniela, and just want to thank Daniela for her heartfelt testimony. I thought, I thought it was critical. Um, maybe, maybe I'll ask a question to Daniela um, if, if she's still on. I, I believe she's still on. 
Um, Danielle, one of the issues that myself and my colleagues have, have worked on is digital equity and equal access to the internet. But have, have you experienced any technical issues um, or your family, have they experienced any technical issues, um, digital, digital equity related access? And if so, can you explain them and maybe uh, give us an idea of how, how we could possibly resolve them if, if, if possible? Thank you. Um, I know for me, one of the difficulties with internet is the software that I use. Um, I use a JAWS and um, sometimes it, it is a screen reader. So sometimes not all the links and or the website is um, accessible. So that is difficult. And I also know once everybody went on remote, sometimes when a lot of people is on internet, like me, when we all, everybody was, you know, on remote and all my kids were on remote on Zoom with school. So the, ten, the internet tends not to work because everybody was using that internet. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was like the advocacy that needed to be done to make sure that we got the right equipment. Um, maybe the equipment that I had then was not so good. So I had to get another equipment. But then when I got the um, new equipment, then the equipment was not compatible to my computer that I was using. So I, then I had to go use, the, I had to go get another computer so that um, computer could be um, accessible to the internet that I was using. So, um, but I think mainly is once we get the link out is basically once, you know, people with disability are able to, you know, voice their choice and saying that like, this link is not helping me. Can we use another link or which link is accessible to be able to, to, to be in a remote successfully? I hope that answered your question. Danielle, it does answer my question. Thank you for your response, and it was very helpful. I know it's very helpful to me and certainly my colleagues, too. So respect your, your answer. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me ask one more question, I guess. Um, I, I really don't know who to ask this question to, but as we, as I highlighted before, but as we go into the budget season, um, certainly I think we need to get an opinion from someone from Do It that could help us um, figure out how much money we, we should be recommending or how much money should be allocated for this. I, I want to make sure if we do this right, if we do it, that we do it right in people like Daniela have equal access to the internet as, as someone from a million dollar home in Back Bay would. Um, so I think, I think it's gonna take the city council to work closely with the mayor's office and the DUA team to make sure that we have the financial means um, to make sure everybody has equal access. And maybe, maybe here's my, my follow-up question to, to anyone during the pandemic, there was a lot of people in my district, but especially in Chinatown that lived in large apartment buildings. They had internet access, but if you had more than one child um, on the internet at the same time, these kids were going to BPS schools, but if you had more than one, one child on this internet, um, the second child would get like bumped off because there wasn't enough um, internet access for the second child. So, so the second child wasn't able to do his or home, his or her um, academic studies along with the teacher and the classmates because of the building structure, because of the internet setup. So how will that impact us as, as we, we roll out this program? And what do we say to people that live in a lot of these high rise types apartment buildings in my district um, many of them are low income, many of them are immigrant families. What do we, how do we assist them? So I guess that's my question to anyone that can, that can give me um, an answer. 
I'm, I'm happy to take a first crack at it. Um, Mr. President, thank you for the thoughtfulness and I appreciate the question. Um, this is one of the reasons why when we began advocating at the state level for a permanent reform, we knew part of the conversation had to be about resources that municipalities would need, um, not just to accommodate the needs in the moment, but really if we wanna make this part of our new normal, how do we address long standing gaps in access? And one of those issues is broadband equity. Um, so again, one of the things I mentioned, I think the timing is really good here, is both the you know massive federal investment in broadband equity. It sounds like Boston might already have access to those funds. If, if not, I know you're probably already working on uh, the digital equity plan. So I, I think that's something that's maybe uniquely to Boston and other larger cities that would be a really important priority to raise in your digital equity plan for ways to best utilize uh, some of those new investments from the federal level. And then the other piece too, again, I'll just mention, uh, you know, it was upsetting it didn't get signed by the governor last session, but we were excited to see the legislature, both the House and Senate pass a very sizable $30 million bond authorization in the general governmental bond bill last July. Uh, and we're really hopeful that they'll do that again so that there will be additional resources coming from the state for municipalities that need to address the IT infrastructure needs and again, to quote Daniela, you know, the pandemic was horrible, but the little bit of a silver lining was that it helped us learn a little bit more about the gaps in access uh, that folks need in the 21st century, especially around broadband access. So I appreciate your attention to it. Um, and again, I'm excited about the federal investments. We're hopeful for further state investments. And we're excited to hear that, you know, perhaps the city of Boston would, would put some money into it too. So happy to be a thought partner all down the road as, as you consider the best way to utilize that money. Thank you, Jeff. And my final comment, not a question, my final comment is, is a plug for an upcoming city council hearing, which is tomorrow, city services, innovation technology hearing tomorrow, docket 0417, order for a hearing to discuss digital equity and municipal broadband tomorrow at 10 o'clock. So if you guys are able to um, zoom in, uh, love to, love to um, have you join us. Uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Mejia. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the advocates uh, for always. And actually, you know what? You guys are civic leaders. You are um, always showing up and redefining what it looks like to uh, really create space for everybody to be heard. And so I just really want to thank you all um, for your participation. I guess for me, it's like, what would you what would you say um, in in terms of accountability and how we can measure success, right? If if we were doing this right, we would pat ourselves on the back and say, "Hey, we got this." What would success look like in 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 terms of implementation? What would you say success would look like? Um. Thank you, Councillor, and thanks for your support for this as well and for attending the hearing today. I really appreciate your time. Um, I think that's would look like, you know, if I as a resident or any other resident of Boston wants to participate in a government meeting, um, that it is really easy for me to find information about how to do that on the city's website and it is very easy for me to attend and if possible make my voice heard whether that means you know showing up in person or just you know clicking to join an online meeting and to to give my comments that way so i think it i think we'll you know we'll be successful if everyone you know no matter what language they speak you know whether they have a disability or they're wrangling a couple small kids at home um has you know as easy a, as possible a means of participating. The Kate say it all, y'all. Did she speak for everybody in here? We good? Okay. Kate is the official spokesperson um, for that answer. So yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I guess like. Um, you know, I always talk about the fact that I'm now in a system that I fought my entire life. And what we really want to just oftentimes just to be heard. And sometimes being heard looks different to different people. And I think that that's a, it's a key thing that um, 
President Flynn brought up in terms of just uh, privilege and access and, and people who are have more means, right? Because knowledge is power, right? And there's people who have it, and there are people who are literally dying for it. And I and I think that as we continue to have these conversations, it's really important for us to to know that uh, that accessibility and being able to share information with the public in a way that is accessible to them, and that includes the the language that we're using to, um, you know, uplift the fact that we're going to be hosting a meeting. There's a lot that sometimes when you're new in government, you have to like. Uh, you need a, a Google Translator just to be like, what in the world was just said? So I think that one thing is the the access to it, but I also think that, and this is not something that we can legislate at this point, it's just about us shifting the culture, is that making sure that even when we are in spaces, that we are even being as accessible as possible to community. Um, and I know that this is not what this conversation is about, but I just want to uplift that, that there is a level of, of for those folks who are now participating more in hearings or in meetings in, in city government, you know, there's a learning curve. There are folks who have never even participated in a hearing, let alone a board or a commission meeting, right? Um, and so as people continue to become more engaged, I think that it's important for us as a city to recognize that we need to start thinking about how we communicate um, and, and uh, the type of information that we share with folks. Uh, I, I just wanted to name that. And I think it would be really nice. Um, and I know with the city council, we have all of our hearings in the YouTube channel. Um, and I, I don't know, and the administration's not here, and I, and I can just probably do this myself, but I'm wondering if it would, if there were, should be like a gallery of like videos that you can click after a meeting if you weren't able to be there in person. And that, you know, instead of 48 hours that maybe if you don't catch that video until a month later, but that there's still an opportunity for you as a constituent to amplify on an issue. And I'm just curious if you have seen that or in, in terms of engagement in other spaces and places that we should uh, look to, to learn from. I want other folks to address this question if they have an answer, but um, thank you for that, Councilor Mejia. And you know, my understanding is that the council's YouTube page is a place where a lot of that information lives. And that's where I frequently go if I'm looking for you know, if I missed a hearing and I want to catch up on what happened. Um, I have long been concerned about that, honestly, that um, it may not be the best situation long term for the city to be relying on uh, a, uh, an outside entity like Google or YouTube to host all of that information on our behalf. I mean, I think we've seen with what's been going on with Twitter that, you know, somebody nasty could take the reins over there and all of a sudden, you know, this whole library of you know government information of public information that the public relies on uh, to have access to could just disappear or you know the city could be required to start spending money that we don't want to spend you know giving to youtube to host all that content so my understanding is that that's currently where where it all lives i do think if it's possible for the city to look into um, an alternate you know, hosting opportunity that it, it could be valuable for, for that information to be hosted on the city's own servers. Although I understand that that um, could involve some cost just because, you know, costs money to store video. But um, I don't know if other folks have thoughts about that. Just would echo Cade's thought about the, the need to make sure municipalities feel confident about the long-term maintenance and ownership of what I'd consider, you know, digital minutes, right? This is uh, right in the, in the category of maintaining the minutes and being able to access them. Um, one thing I, I would love to just shout out are all the, and you know, Boston's got great partnerships, many of the gateway cities do, even rural communities have great partners in the nonprofit space that, that sometimes in many cases subsidize some of the telecommunication needs. Um, and so they are also just great partners that are part of this conversation, part of that infrastructure. Some of them I know uh, might host the videos on their website. Um, so I just think there's great opportunity in this conversation to also engage more broadly in the community for who could bring in those resources. But I, I, I appreciate Kate's concern about maybe just relying on the big companies like YouTube because we don't know what their short-term or long-term future could be. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I know President Flynn is always saying, who's going to pay for it? And where's the budget for that? And I think that, you know, while we are, 
you know, having a visioning session and trying to figure out kind of the how, I just think it's important for us to have a level of maintaining the integrity of our, the, our own property, right? And to be able to ensure that the public knows that, you know, that we own it, we, we are mining that data, we are mining that, that so that there's a sense of security um, too. So I think that, you know, there, there, there are some things that we may need to look at for a future conversation, but I just, I'm glad that you were bringing it up here in this space for us to really um, think about what that potentially could look like. And the city has a lot of resources. I always say we're, we're resource rich and coordination poor. Um, and there's uh, so many different, um, you know, startup tech companies around here that, you know, there's also there's BU Spark. There are a lot of different um, schools here that we can potentially collaborate with to design something that is long term, that is led by the city, but that also gives an opportunity for students to be engaged in designing what that looks like, right? So that could be a win win that also includes community voice and in terms of building a platform. So I, I, I'm always for the like, let's figure out what is possible. And, and, and the figure out the how can we do it and who are the people that can help us make it happen. Um, so I'm encouraged by, by that. And I'm not gonna hold everybody hostage for the sake of holding you all hostage. I am going to defer whatever little time I have if any. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I wanna read into uh, just the record a letter of absence from uh, Councilor Murphy that was sent to us. Uh, I will read it now. I am writing to inform you of my absence during today's city council hearing on docket 0452 regarding ordinance providing remote access to meetings of municipal public bodies. A representative from my staff will be listening in and following up with me. I look forward to reviewing the footage and following up as need be. I sincerely regret that I could not attend the hearing this afternoon as I made prior commitments that I must keep. Thank you, Erin Murphy. Um, if anybody has any, any further questions that they would like to uh, ask the panel. Uh, I'm gonna give the floor to folks for a second round if they need it. If nobody needs it, then we are going to move to uh, public comment. We have a few public speakers uh, here for this, uh, or rather people from the public here for this. Uh, and so uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to ask the panel before I go to the public comment? And it looks like we're going straight to public comment. So if we can bring in Lisa Beatman, uh, Joe Tringali, and Ember Delgado. Uh, I'm going to ask that you just state your name, uh, any affiliation if you're speaking on behalf of an organization, uh, neighborhood if you're speaking on behalf of yourself, uh, and then I'm going to set a timer for two minutes. I tend to give folks uh, a little bit of run over time. Uh, if I unmute and start to talk to you, it's because you're probably past three minutes. Uh, and so uh, the goal here is keep it around two, but if you go a little bit over, I will give you some grace. And so. We'll start with Lisa Beatman. Uh, yes, hello everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Um, I sent uh, all of the city councilors and the uh, committee yesterday a detailed uh, letter of advocacy. Um, I'm not going to uh, repeat that, uh, but listening to um, all of the all of the contributions today, uh, I have some uh, follow-up uh, comments and questions uh, that I would appreciate some response to. So I'm Lisa Beatman. I'm co-leader of Mount Hope Canterbury Neighborhood Association in Eastern Rosendale. Uh, I'm a member of various local coalitions, and I have spent a career working with speakers of other languages. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, Councilor Mejia for your strong ongoing advocacy regarding language access to public meetings. Um, uh, one thing you mentioned, you asked about uh, guardrails uh, so that uh, people who are more closely impacted uh, by something you know, like a proposed project in a meeting would uh, not get drowned out by people who coming from outside. Uh, one simple fix is simply, you know, at every meeting, ask the speakers to state the neighborhood and the street where they live. Um, and again, I'm speaking from so, so much experience being on all sides of this issue and hearing 
uh, people, you know, some uh, participants in, for example, um, BPDA meetings claim that they live very near the proposed project and that there's no problem with it and everything's easy, um, but they don't. Uh, and those of us who, you know, who live here and run civic associations, we often know that, whereas the officials um, running the meetings may not. So that's a simple fix. My main advocacy is about these simple fixes, which I'm just not hearing enough well about and not seeing uh, essential things change. Uh, I want to thank Councillor Lu Jun for representing constituents regarding improving and maximizing the use of Zoom tools for further public, for fuller public access and participation, as I wrote in the letter that you received. And also for mentioning the importance of community building in the process. It makes me feel heard and many other constituents, including other civic leaders. We've also been waiting to be heard. Many, resident, many residents learn most about public meetings and get informed about proposed projects impacting them through participating in neighborhood meetings, neighborhood association meetings, receiving detailed neighborhood association notices, being encouraged to participate and give feedbacks um, while in our meetings, and last but certainly not least, by seeing and hearing other residents, uh, whether you know they agree or don't agree, um, but that they're not alone. Um, feeling alone really generally um, is a barrier to participation. Uh, thank you, President Flynn, for referring, for referring to city councilors accountability to constituents. And that is in some ways my main theme. Um, simply using all Zoom tools is free. No funding is needed. Volunteers using running civic associations Many of us with rudimentary tech skills are using them for full, transparent, and inclusive participation. Why are paid, trained municipal staff not using them? And you know, the ones that I listed in my letter, uh, uh, showing everybody who's at the meeting, uh, having uh, fully uh, usable chats that are savable, having Q and A. This meeting doesn't even have a Q and A function. Uh, why? Um, uh, Brianna Miller, um, you said, um, you mentioned that best practices were developed um, so that people can use what Zoom tools work for them. Now, I believe you were referring to the municipal meeting host. What just a, just a heads up, Lisa, you have four minutes. Okay, I'm almost done. Thank you. So what about what works for the residents? You said that optional best practices were developed. Please make them all available to the public all the time. Clearly, most municipal meeting hosts, including these, have and are continuing to opt out of using these full public access tools. It has been over two years since residents like me have communicated our concerns and frustrations to you. The lack of response and improvements, unfortunately, perpetuates too many residents' cynicism and therefore lack of engagement. The city needs to walk the civic engagement talk. For example, uh, so I would appreciate hearing from various electeds and appointeds on this call explanations of why the city is avoiding these basic, easy, free, available tools and full, for full access. And why is there no policy for using them, training, supervision, and enforcement for consistent use of them? Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. And I think I actually have somewhat of an answer on some of that, which is the Q&A and the chat functions on Zoom. We have to preserve all of this as open meeting record law. And that does not naturally save itself, nor do private conversations um, go to the public. Sorry about that. That's for the second time. Uh, go to the public in that way. And so I think the originally, initially during COVID, those features were taken out to avoid having any issues with open meeting laws and having private conversations happening during a meeting. Um, but I don't know what the status of that is now. I know that that's sort of what the reasoning was initially, um, just to that specific point. Um, but I'm sure that the administration will, will look into those other things as well and see where we stand on the law moving forward on how we use these tools. So thank you, Lisa. Um, is Joe Tringali 
on I think he left, Mr. Chair. I don't okay. believe he's left. Who, who is still present? Just bring them in and now Amber Delgado is next. Hey Amber, the floor is yours once you're once you're ready. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're perfect. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, hi everyone, my name is Amber Delgado and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator of the Boston Preservation Alliance. Um, on behalf of the Alliance, I would like to speak in support of continued use of remote access. The preservation community has greatly benefited from being able to attend meetings and hearings remotely. The option of remote access has heightened accessibility and inclusion from underrepresented communities to take part in historic preservation conversations and uh, has had a positive impact on the outcomes in their neighborhoods. In order to better protect places that matter to Boston residents, we need to directly hear from Boston residents and virtual meetings provide a seat at the table for thousands of Bostonians who can't get to downtown city hall five o'clock meetings on a Tuesday, um, which is when many commission meetings are held. So um, we just want to voice our support for continued remote access. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Amber, uh, for your time. Thank you. Jacob de Blaycourt. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the sponsors for creating this much needed conversation. My name is Jacob de Blaycourt, and I'm a resident of Alston. After nearly three years working on the council, I never really thought I would see myself on this side of the virtual chamber, let alone that I would be speaking on an issue like this. But accessibility is one of those things that you never really think about until it directly impacts your life. This is something that I've experienced personally. After a surgery last year, I had trouble walking upstairs, which meant that I wasn't actually able to go to my own home in Alston because I live in a three-story walk-up. But while I was physically struggling to access spaces, I found that my ability to access civic spaces hadn't changed because there were remote options available. And as a policy writer, creating spaces that are more accessible to more people uh, is more than just a symbolic gesture. It also just makes our deliberations richer and more substantive. It's actually what inspired me to launch an accessibility town hall on April 27th so that we can all come together to figure out how to make it easier for people to play a role in their community. I urge you all to pass this crucial ordinance, but also to continue to find new ways to make public meetings more accessible by providing food, childcare, Zoom improvements like the one Lisa has mentioned, and interpretation services as well. Thank you to the makers for offering this ordinance, and thank you also, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Is that everybody who we have? Uh, Christine for public comment. I think that's everybody. Perfect. Uh, so I don't know if anyone would like to make any closing comments before I close this out. Uh, otherwise, I would just close this out. All right. So uh, thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you for this proposal uh, from our original sponsors. Thank you to the advocates and to the members of the public who took the time to attend today and to make their voices heard, really appreciate it. Uh, Councilor Braden, I see you turned your camera on. I'm not sure if you have anything you would like to say in closing. No, I just want to thank everyone for their participation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Louis Jen. Gonna echo my, uh, uh, the sponsor here and uh, thank her for her work and thank all the advocates and those who gave public testimony for, uh, so that we can strengthen this ordinance. Really important, so really grateful for everyone's input here. Thank you. Thank you, and Councilor Braden, just want to say, I, I really do like the purple with the purple on the background there. It looks very nice. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you to our central staff for making sure these things uh, work and move uh, the way that they should. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're that we're going to adjourn this hearing. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>